Hello everybody, good morning. Hopefully uh, you can all hear me. And welcome to this webcast. Um, my name is uh, Joel Barnes. I'm the uh, SE manager for uh, EMEA for Tripwire, so I essentially run uh, all the technical team here within EMEA. And this presentation is um, around a sort of slightly less, uh, slightly less Tripwire focus area, which is around convergence of technologies. Um, I will be uh, covering off a whole bunch of different things, but the key thing really here is how can we as security professionals get more value out of the systems that we already own? It's a, it's a critical thing because these days we are driven to be as secure as possible, but of course our constraints around resourcing, personnel, money, all of that sort of thing, they are all you know, getting smaller. So we need to be able to start getting more out of what we have. And there are a variety of different ways to do this. Um, what I'm going to cover today is just some ideas around, you know, certainly why you should even think about sort of looking at convergence, and then what it actually means as far as infosecurity is concerned. And then there's examples of how we deliver that sort of uh, value through to customers. So if I just sort of... Um, look at the uh, agenda that we're going to go through today. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is what do we actually mean by convergence? Um, what does it mean in the context of information security? So uh, how do we actually use this idea within the areas that we all work to try and get further value out of what we do? Um, what does it even look like? So when we do, you know, it's a nice all very well to talk about a concept but what does that actually mean when we actually put it into practice? How does that give us value? How do we implement it? You know, what do we actually need to do here? And then how to drive it. So what are the, you know, these are the technical examples of how you know, we think there is a, a huge amount of value in bringing these controls together. So that's kind of where we, the, the agenda that we're going to cover off today. I don't imagine it's going to take the full hour that's scheduled. Um, I, I can talk for a lot longer. If you have any questions, please add them into the uh, uh, Q&A box and I'll happily answer them as we go through or probably more likely at the end. So first thing, um, what do we actually mean by convergence? So we need to define this side of things. And there's a couple of sort of areas really. There's, there's many different definitions. You can go to dictionary.com and look at convergence and you'll find a whole bunch. Uh, seven or more, depending on you know, which dictionary you want to use. But there's two sort of areas that we want to look at, mainly because they do have similarities to each other. So there is a technological convergence point, uh, which is a tendency for different technological systems to evolve towards performing similar tasks or even the same overall job. So you, know, you find various bits of technology that will do one thing, and then other bits of technology will come in and do essentially the same thing. Now, that means that you end up with duplication of technology. If you're not careful, you, so, you, know, you start looking at how you use your various different bits of technology in the most appropriate way. If you've got overlap, is there a reason behind that? If there isn't a reason behind that, do you need to start removing bits of technology from your organization? The other side is the evolutionary convergence, which is uh, sort of biological traits uh, developing in unrelated organisms. Um, that have fundamentally different jobs in an environment. So it's, got, you know, it's the you know, different streams ending up in the same place, but for completely different reasons. So why you know, we are looking at these is because we're going to start looking at how we can get these things, you know, these two sort of definitions to come together into something that we can then use. So if we just sort of focus in on the technological convergence to start with, um, combining different jobs into a single unit. Well, you know, to keep it nice and high level, if you think of something like the Wii, um, other games consoles are available. Um, they have internet connections, they've got built-in web browsers, social networking apps, all sorts of different things in here. So it's no longer just a, hey, it plays games, or you play games on it. Um, but now you can watch TV, you can shop on it, you can buy music, you can check in with friends, you can do all sorts of different things on a single piece of technology. So we're bringing everything together. Similarly, um, you can look at getting different jobs onto the same unit for like a, um, a cell phone or 
mobile phone or whatever you want to call them these days, where you're actually doing completely different things. So you could check the weather, you could play games, you can buy tickets, you can do shopping, you can send and receive email, you can do, oh, uh, make a telephone call, uh, a very novel concept when it comes to a cell phone these days. You can do a whole variety of different things, and they're all coming into a single unit. So these things, I mean, particularly the mobile phone or the smartphone, has been almost revolutionary in, in actually bringing all these things together. No one really thought that it was a good idea to start with. Now they're ubiquitous. Everybody has them. And you know, I know from personally, I can't live without it. I need to be able to get a hold of all these things. And now it's very sort of standard. That's not the case when we start, start talking about information security. They're still very siloed. There's still lots of different products. We need to start bringing all these things together. There's also um, examples of um, fairly poor convergence. Um, people bringing things together that don't need to come together. Um, an example here is, you know, here's a fridge with a TV in the middle of it. Well, yeah, you can kind of say that that's the way to do things, but you know, typically what we're really saying is that you know, your fridge is in your kitchen. You tend not to watch TV in the kitchen. You should be eating dinner or cooking or doing something else. You know, why would you do this? It's a very expensive thing. It takes up room. It's kind of, why bother? Similarly, you know, a car with wings and an engine on it. You know, we all love the idea of flying cars. Yay, we'll get places. But as a technology, it makes limited... The idea is right, but the actual implementation of it is useless. You know, particularly things like, you know, that you've got to get a runway, and then you've got to somehow drive down a road without wings on, otherwise you'll take people's heads off as you go past them. You know, it doesn't work. Ideas great, practicalities do not work. So it's not a matter of going out there and saying, we must get everything to work together. Some things are just inherently not going to work together. So taking a look at what the why things come together and which things come together is absolutely vital in getting this sort of value or the added value out of what you own. So if we look at the, some of the evolutionary side of things, you know, Similar structures evolve even though they serve radically different jobs. Now, in this particular instance, you know, lo there's lots of things, creatures that have wings. They come from completely different evolutionary uh, paths. So, you know, we've got bats. You know, they have to fly, um, and the reason they fly is because they have to catch insects and things like that. But if we then look, you know, we can then have an insect, completely different evolutionary tree, but they're coming together and converging. Now, they need to fly because they need to get from one place to another, blah, 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 to get ne nectar and do all the fun things that butterflies do. Similarly, you know, you've got birds who are, you know, they are flying because it gives them great oversight and be able to see things and then be able to get down on them and come from unexpected angles, all sorts of other things, as well as the standard, you know, getting from A to B. So they've all got the same attributes, but they're coming at it from a different angle. And that's sort of where we really want to be going. So when we're looking at what we're sort of talking about today is we're trying to get that sort of evolutionary convergence of different things doing different jobs, but trying to bring them into a sort of common framework that can help you to get value out of all of them. They're all sort of pulling in the same direction, but with different views on the world. So we're trying to do this evolutionary convergence, but viewed in the context of information security technologies. That's where we're coming from. And it's not about adding features into these things. That's sort of the key component here. We're not trying to say you, know, you need a single product or a single solution that does 1,500 different things. So you want a single solution that does endpoint security, network security, uh, DLP, uh, NAC, uh, you know, firewalling, you know, you know that you're not going to get that from a single product. And looking to do that essentially gives you a, a, a very limited choice in what you w can actually use, and B, you're not going to get the best of breeds into everything. So you need to look at things that are sort of leveraging the same concepts that you can then bring together so that you can start um, you know, sort of adding them to get that you know, terribly cliched one plus one equals more than two kind of thing. So look at things like architecture, structure, design, language, what environments they're fitting within. There are many things that fit within the same places. They're doing the same type of thing. 
you want to look at those in the same area. Different products to reach a common end or a common goal. That's sort of where we're really driving here. And then you want to have a synergy between them all so they all perform better based on the, the fact that they are doing these different jobs. What this essentially comes down to is a level of context that you can view within a sphere of influence of a particular solution and how that context can be applied across other solutions. So there are, I'll talk about specific examples later, but what I want you to sort of take away is that looking at your solutions and what they deliver, you need to, what we need to do as professionals is look at what that information means beyond its own right. And I'll talk about how we do that as we go forwards. So the basic premises where, where Tripwire are coming from, similarities are good, but differences actually are very, you know, are very key. They do matter. So if we look at vulnerability assessment, security configuration management, and file integrity monitoring, you know, they're three technologies that do different things, ultimately. Um, but they have the same underlying principles. You cannot replace one with any of the others. So, you know, if you, want to, if you need to do vulnerability assessment, you need to go out, you need to find all your assets, you need to find what's on those assets, you need to find how you're doing around the patching levels or whether you're doing mitigation around you know, all the various different processes you need to do there. If you've got everything on all of your uh, applications configured, um, patched and secure, brilliant. But if you've got, you know, no firewall on the box, you've got blank admin passwords on the box, then you're not secure. And that's where the security configuration management piece comes in. You cannot, you have to do these things essentially separately because they're different disciplines. And then once you get down to the sort of monitoring for change on a device to see, you know, as a leading indicator of a breach or something going on, that again, is something that you need to look at in real time, whereas configuration management tends to be on a more periodic basis. And there's a level of detail associated with that. So there's lots of different things here, and they cannot really do the same job. So if you're going to have to use multiple solutions to address security, try and get the best out of them. And use, but don't just think, mash these things together. There are you know, subtleties behind this that we need to consider. So, if I skip forward slide, excuse me. So, what does it mean in the context of Insta? So, where does this occur and how? So, I'm, I'm going to focus in on you know security configuration management, vulnerability assessment, fire integrity monitoring, and see where it fits within an environment. So, what we have is a whole bunch of infrastructure. So we all have this. We can look in uh, our CMDB if we have one. We can look in Excel if we have, I'm sure we have Excel. We have somewhere, whether it's in someone's head or whether it's in a system, we know what we own. So we have a whole plethora of different device types that are out there, from bring your own devices through desktops, file servers, data. I'm not going to read them all out. Um, but you can, you know, in your head, you can catalog you know, 10, 15 different device types that are in there. And then there is a, a sort of inherent view of, you know, what do we need to do to secure these things? So some things are, are, are going to be very, very critical to you. So you need to spend more time and money and controls and stuff against them. And some things are less critical. So, you know, if uh, you know, a wireless access point, for example, falls over or whatever, and you've got a whole bunch of mitigating security technology behind that and someone compromises it, then you may well be quite safe. Whereas if someone were to compromise or a system were to fall over that runs your primary uh, website for taking customer payments and takes that down for eight hours, that's going to have a completely different set of monitoring requirements and criticalities associated with it. Essentially, there's a risk-based model that we've got here. And ultimately, what that means is that you've got a decision to make around the depth of the data, of data you get off a device, uh, the frequency of which 
at which you sort of run these scans, whether you want it in real time or whether periodic is appropriate, and then the level of detail that we get off there. So you know, there are decisions to make across all of these things. So vulnerability management tends to sit across everything. So that's where that sits. It's kind of, you know, it's generally an IP-based thing. So you say, right, go find me stuff on these subnets. Um, identify what they are, and then start telling me where the, vulner the known vulnerabilities are in here. So it's scan everything. It's often externally based, so you know, just sort of you know, hit ports and find out what's on the end of them and see what versions and, and all that sort of fun stuff. Um, or, but it certainly would be recommended that you do credential-based scanning as well to try and get you know, more details off there. It's externally based, and it tends to be fairly uh, shallow collection of information. Ultimately, you know, it's an inventory and an assessment of whether that inventory is up to date. That's kind of how it works. Um, it assesses known vulnerabilities using published CVEs or patch policies. Most people don't do this in real time. They tend to scan every week, every month, so they'll have their environment, and they'll have a process that gets them from not done any scanning to fully scanned over a period of time. Depending on the complexity of the network and all sorts of other things, that could range from weekly to monthly to quarterly. Obviously, the more you do it, the better, but there is an impact in doing this, as in the more you find, the more you need to fix. But you know, from a security point of view, that's great because we see more, more data allows us to act more, allows us to have more decisions. On the other end of this system, you've got file integrity monitoring, which is you know, going in and viewing exactly what is on a device and then how it's changing, looking at content, looking at you know, hash values, looking at permissions, a whole bunch of different stuff in here that tends to be very detailed so that you can make a decision. So if someone were to, you know, if you saw a whole bunch of stuff going onto a system, is that system being patched? For example, in which case that you know, doesn't really matter. Um, well, it matters obviously, but it wouldn't be seen as a critical change. Whereas if you see a whole bunch of changes going in outside of your change window on a critical file server that's sitting at the end of a you know, bad WAN link and things like that, is that something you need to look at? Lots of different questions get raised by this. Typically, it tends to be across only your critical assets. The reason being is that the, the sheer volume of data that can come out of um, the file integrity monitoring piece um, means that you need to do a lot of assessment around how you deal with that data. It's also um, an agent-based, essentially, typically, because you have to sit on a device. And the reason behind that is because if you're going to do file integrity monitoring, you're going to do it properly, you need to essentially sit on the device and watch changes as they happen. Otherwise, you end up in a situation whereby you know, I run a check and then a week later I run a check and you know, 15 people have made changes to the same things, I see one big change and I don't know who did it. You know, I'm missing so much data here that I need to be able to do this in real time. So you've got that level of depth and frequency that's increased massively as we go down that, that stack. So that fits typically within your critical infrastructure. The final piece is the security configuration management piece, which is, you know, I'm going to assess and make sure that my devices are configured to a known good standard. The reason being is that I, you know, I have a whole bunch of uh, standards out there, but what I want to know is that bits of my environment are as I expect them to be. So if I have a policy of how I build a particular firewall or a server or whatever, I want to make sure that it is actually built that way and put into the environment that way and then maintained within that environment that way. The reason I have this security policy is so that I can have a secure system. If things are changing and it's becoming less secure, I need to know why. So this is essentially hardening standards. This is more of your proactive approach of keeping it you know, nicely locked down so you know what it is, you can reduce the risk value associated with it. It is as you expect it to be, and it's maintained as you expect it to be. So it's a continual process around this. Typically, this is a daily or weekly. So if you think, you know, top of the vulnerability management stack, you're looking at weekly, monthly. Often, that's an issue just because of the volume of assets you've got there. At the very bottom with file integrity, you could be looking at real-time or hourly 
or, or daily. In the middle, you're tending to look at daily, weekly kind of thing. So that's sort of the continuum in here. And the security configuration management component tends to sit across a wider variety of systems. So, you know, FIM right down on the very critical assets, vulnerability across everything, and SEM somewhere in between. Um, you can do it across everything, and we have, custom, you know, we have customers who are doing it across you know, 30, 40,000 assets. Um, other people are doing it across you know, 10, 15, because they see those as the critical ones. It all depends on the risk appetite and the amount of you know, resource you have available to be able to really go into this. So that's sort of where we, we kind of sit within these various different things. So they're doing different things. They're doing them across different assets. How do you get all this stuff together and make it usable between them? So ultimately, what we're really talking about, if I get my animation to go, is a defense in depth strategy, right? I mean, this is what we're doing. This is nothing new or exciting, um, but it's something that we need to do. The key thing really is how these things interact with each other. So how do we get data from the FIM component into the SCM component, into the vulnerability management component, or the other way? What, where is the best place for data to be shared between these so that we have a better view of what's actually happening? It allows us to focus ourselves better, allows us to see the areas where we're most at risk to be able to put further controls on these things as well. So here are all of our assets again, um, but there's commonalities here, right? I mean, I've talked about you know, where you should do these, but there's commonalities across these different axes. So across the top, we have all of our different device types from you know, all your virtualization systems, your servers, things like that. But there's common notions across all of these. There's a risk issue associated with them. There's a priority. You know, if I see something fail on this system, what does the business say I need to do? You know, if, it's, you know, if I'm a telco, a telco provider and someone, something has happened that's degraded you know, the service to my, my customers suddenly, you know, rather than getting 40 meg per second, they're suddenly getting one. Um, you know, there's lots of people who rely on that. That, that would be, you know, a, could be an absolutely critical thing. So that's a priority one. Whereas if something is you know, affecting a DNS lookup or something like that, and there's a backup there, and things like that, that might be priority five. Now, it all depends on how you want to view these various different things. There's also a level of dependency. You know, which systems, are, you know, if you've got an application that is critical to your business, say a payment information, uh, sorry, a payment processing application, that application tends not to sit on one server that you can po point at and say, that is my payment server and that is what I need to look at. It'll sit across multiple databases, it'll have routing through the network, it'll have firewalls, it'll have authentication systems, it could be spread across multiple servers. There's a whole bunch of stuff around there. So what depends on what? What is actually part of the same sort of ecosystem and that you can define? And ultimately, this comes down to the business value. So if you know what the risk and priority and dependencies are of a system, you should also know what the business value of it is. And this is more tricky to find. You know, technology can tell you how secure something is, and it can probably tell you a whole bunch of information about the asset. But the business value of that asset is something that is more tricky to define because as security professionals, we need to make sure everything is secure and you know, we need to look at risk profiling and all sorts of other stuff. But it's up to the business to decide what is most critical. If you think of DR strategies and things like that, you know, they are already looking at business value. What do we need to get back in the worst case scenario? You know, and what order we, do we need to do it in? And security is part of that. But a business functions based on you know, how it gains revenue, ultimately. So those systems that gain revenue are going to have the highest business value. And they may not be the, I, the items that we as security professionals are actually focusing on. So there is information in here that's very important to get hold of. And then there's the, the delights of language. Um, you know, how do we define what we mean um, when we're talking about our environment? And what does that mean to 
someone further up the scale or someone who has no idea about security or IT or anything like that? How do we translate these various different things and keep it consistent across the various different device types and across the various different teams? Because we have different teams accessing different things and managing different things. On the other side, where we're talking about you know, how we monitor these systems, and ultimately that's essentially what we're doing, then there's a whole bunch of stuff. So how often, you know, when do we do it? How often do we do it? What level do we do it to? What about exceptions on there? What about alerting? These all have different values um, that we need to associate, but they're common. So an asset can sit anywhere on the continuum of time, depth, alerting, all that sort of stuff. So these sort of common commonalities are where we need to start bringing this convergence together. Different technologies, but they've got these commonalities between them. And I'm sure you can add in other technologies that you know, you're familiar with and see how they all come together. Now, there's obviously technological difficulties in how we bring all this stuff together, but you know, that's life. So how do we tie all this stuff together to provide a better defense in depth on here. That's what we're going to go through for the rest of this presentation. So where do we see examples of this? So you know, I've, or, I've just sort of stood up metaphorically and said, here's Anna, some examples of how we should bring these you know, common components of different technologies together. But is, it, you know, is this a drive that's actually happening beyond what Joel Barnes says to you? Um, and we are seeing it in a variety of different areas. So um, there are big regulations and uh, standards that are starting to say, actually, you need to do this. If you're not doing this, you're missing a trick. There is a gap. There is something somewhere where information will slip through and it will mean that you're doing the wrong thing on the wrong thing or could mean that you're doing that. So... In this particular case, you know, the NERC side, which is, um, I know it's not relevant necessarily in EMEA, but we are seeing some uptick of the regulations around energy providers. The reason being is that it's um, a vector for nation state attacks and things like that. That is actually quite concerning. You know, if, if someone were to bring down the, you know, the electricity grid across a, a country, that's got very, very serious implications. So being able to get hold of this the, the NERC guys are actually doing exactly this. They're basically saying, you, know, you need to do this. And they're doing a bunch of stuff. So as an example, um, the version 5, um, it pulls vulnerability assessment, change auditing, and configuration management from separate areas and combines them back into a single area. So it's called configuration management and vulnerability assessment. They're already bringing these things together. They're seen as things you should do at a... You know, a single level, although they are ultimately different disciplines. Similarly, um, there's convergences in finance. I mean, finance has been very highly regulated anyway, and, and it can be fairly risk averse. But network and security configuration management, vulnerability assessment and penetration testing, you know, they're all coming together. This is 9.3 and 9.4 in here. So, you know, they're part of the same section. So you need to start getting this stuff together. Um, this is uh, the Monetary Authority of Singapore risk management guidelines. Um, so there's lots of stuff in there, and you know, MAS has got a whole bunch of stuff around monitoring for change and all sorts of fun bits in there as well. So bringing this stuff together allows you to get more value out of each one, but it also allows you to reduce the workload on getting this stuff done. Um, and there's stuff coming out of the UK as well. I mean, this is from CSG. Um, you know, there's essentially looking at putting vulnerability assessment and confu security configuration management in control group under the heading secure configs. And I think you know, it, it's important to think about security configuration management as exactly that. It's not just security configuration assessment. Just like vulnerability management is not vulnerability assessment. It's a process that we go through to make sure that things are maintained at an acceptable level. So you, know, you don't just do a vulnerability scan w once every year and then fix everything you find off that. You know, that would be one way of doing it, but you've got a year's worth of not assessing and not knowing. It's exactly the same as security configuration management. If you look at the definition of security configuration management, a lot of that is around things like um, 
continuous compliance and things like that so that you know if I push something out into the wild I can actually see on a day-by-day -day basis how it's varying from my standard that way you can start you know increasing the monitoring on there without increasing the workload and things like that so there's lots of stuff in there and it's happening across these regulations um, it's also the, the analysts are doing exactly the same thing so Gartner and Securiosis um, highlight the connection of vulnerability management and SCM. You know, they're kind of push, pulling them into a single point um, because they are complementary disciplines. And if we look at it in more detail, there's um, a map of VM-rated stuff. So we've, we've got SIM in here. We've got GRC stuff in here. We've got vulnerability assessment and security configuration assessment and things like that. So it's kind of starting to view these disciplines as complementary, but you need to do them properly. So that means that you need to start looking at best of breed technologies and then how you bring those together, rather than looking at anything else. So, let's go forward from here. So, what examples are there of technical convergence and what do they give me? So this is where we're going to sort of scoot through from here, and this is you know, the, the tail end of the presentation here. It's kind of trying to get a little bit more on the concrete of how we do this. So if we look at um, the vulnerability assessment, security configuration management, and FIM, or file integrity monitoring, um, it is a killer combination because it, it drives information backwards and forwards between these various different solutions. Um, they all three controls view vulnerabilities and threats in much the same way. There is, you know, there's profiling, there's risk, you know, uh, the assessment of, you know, some level of business criticality, all these various different things. All can be proactive controls that ensure robust security. I do apologise for the insure; it should be an ensure. Um, the idea of purely reactive controls is one that is, um, yeah, it's past its time at the moment. We need to be proactive. You know it's becoming more and more of an issue. So if you can get more proactive controls and then focus those controls appropriately, that will help immeasurably. All of these things speak the language of risk, whether it's a vulnerability risk, whether it's a configuration risk, whether it's a change risk. They all have risk within them. Now, risk is a, a whole other topic and I'm, that is, can be very, very tricky. Um, different people have different views on exactly how risk is defined. But ultimately, you know, these all have a level of sort of risk awareness, if you like, that can be provided across them. And then um, we can certainly you know, connect all this stuff by getting this level of context back to what the business actually needs. And one of the issues, and is beyond the scope of this presentation, um, but one of the issues that we have as security professionals is how we tell people who have no idea what we do, what we do and how valuable it is. Um, it, that's been ongoing for years. The idea that, you know, hey, we gave you loads of money and nothing happened. Well, we won't give you the money because if we don't give you the money, nothing will happen continually. You know, it's, it's kind of that level of, ah, we need to deal with it. So if I scoot through here, um, so just sort of look at the vulnerability assessment, security configuration, security configuration management, and file integrity monitoring piece. There are similar views. Asset groupings, business units, geographies, compliance oversight, service dependencies, um, they are all relevant across all of these disciplines and other disciplines as well. You know, where, you know, where an asset sits geographically will have huge implications about how you route changes and change requests and all that sort of stuff. Um, what business unit is, it implies you know, who do you need to report to if something were to happen. Um, you know, if you look at service dependencies, which teams need to be involved if something were to happen. And they're across all of these different disciplines and others as well. Um, and they all have the same notion of risk and severity. So configuration failures on an unpatched system that has experienced unexpected or bad changes. Now, if you combine those three things together, you've got an issue. You've got something you actually get your hands around and say, okay, I see this is a higher risk because of these three things from three separate components of my security infrastructure give me insight into what I need to actually go and do. And that's ultimately what any security control should be doing. It should be telling you things you need to do rather than just giving you a whole bunch of stuff. You need to have actionable 
information that you can go and do something about. When used correctly, various different vulnerability assessment, SCM and FIM components are used proactively. So when vulnerability assessment is used to determine where overall patching strategies have lapsed, it is starting to become proactive, essentially pointing out where you need to focus effort to make sure that you're addressing deficiencies before they're seen. If you uh, use SCM, you can see your overall security posture and you can essentially pre-harden systems before you see a risk associated with them. Standard server builds, standard deployments, change management process, all of those things will help as a proactive measure for, for increasing your security levels. And then critical change information and SIM integration and things like that. So if I see a critical change take place, is that a leading indicator of a breach or some sort of thing? You know, if I see someone go and change, um, let's keep it quite simple, uh, a logging uh, configuration on a system, so they've stopped sending log events to my log management system, well, my log management system might pick it up, but it also might, they might have changed the, the um, endpoint, so it's only sending boring, you know, non-critical messages. If I see that, that could be a leading indicator of someone trying to cover their tracks before doing something else. That is a proactive use of stuff like file integrity monitoring, rather than just looking at what changed as you go through. Being able to combine these things together is where the value lies. So if I see that change take place on a non-critical system, do I want to alert anyone? If I see it taking place on a highly critical system or a highly vulnerable system, I may want to alert someone. Uh, there are similar languages across various different things. So um, there's the CVEs for vulnerability assessment, the CCEs as well, common config enumerations. And if you look at things like some of the MITRE stuff around XCCDF and the SCAP scanning and things like that, there are common frameworks starting to come together. There's languages that are starting to be talked about around trying to standardize these things. Some of them are further ahead of others. You know, CVE is, is good, but, you know, it's, it's still not fully exhaustive, so we're having to use other things as well to get vulnerability data. CCEs, again, they give unique identifiers for security-related system configuration issues across multiple information sources, but there's not that many of them. So, you know, there's a definition issue in here. And finally, um, getting this information out. So, you know, if we can get this information together, can we combine it to give information to the business? So all three solutions provide security posture information, whether it's on a vulnerability status, a build quality status, or a change status. Um, but they're all suited in their own ways to indicate the susceptibility of a system to an attack or the risk to it. And all three can roll these various different bits of information up. Number of unpatched vulnerabilities, is it rising or falling? Um, configuration failure count, is it going up or down? Unapproved change counts, we're seeing lots of changes that we haven't seen permissions in there. If you see these you know, spikes or something like that, you'll have a, a sort of insight into what you need to do and where you need to focus. So let's um, head to next slide. So more specifically, how do we do it as Tripwire? Well, there's multiple different ways. So we have you know, products all over. We have you know, our main products, we have our IP360 product, we have a Tripwire Enterprise product, we have Tripwire Log Center as our, you know, three of our products. IP360 does its vulnerability management piece. Tripwire Enterprise does security configuration management and file integrity monitoring. You know, that's why we're talking about it today. We have automated all sorts of things in there. So IP360 has a unique way of scoring vulnerabilities. So it doesn't just look at um, high, medium, low, 1 to 10, 1 to 5, 1 to 3, whatever you want to look at it. We have a, that looks, our scoring mechanism looks at um, you know, how easy a vulnerability is to exploit, how long it's been in the wild, and then the level of access it delivers. And it can score it across a huge range of numbers. That allows you to sort of see how critical is critical, how 5 is 5, you know, how high is high. It gives you that insight. But that information is useful for Tripwire Enterprise. So if I've got a highly vulnerable system, for whatever reason, I want to make sure that it's hardened. So I need to make sure that the most appropriate policy is maintained on there. Um, I may want to ramp up you know, the level of file integrity monitoring. I may want to monitor more things or monitor it in real time rather than doing it on an hourly or daily basis. That information that's in IP360 is very useful. 
so this is just showing that you know we have in uh, at the next release of IP360, which should be this month, um, we have direct integration with our tagging system in Tripwire Enterprise. So when I see an asset exceed a certain risk value, I can tag that asset in Tripwire Enterprise, so I can then apply different levels of control over it. That allows me to then report differently, so I can have a dashboard that looks at my configurations of my highly vulnerable assets. I can now focus my efforts there, because I can't do everything. Similarly, we can also look at critical, specific critical vulnerabilities. So, you know, I've got something here that basically is saying, if I see, if IP360 sees anything about easily guessed credentials, so someone's got, you know, a bad password or a blank password, then tag the asset in TE as well. That way we can then monitor who accesses that system and what they do on it. So they've got easy credentials. Are they using those easily guessed credentials to make changes on that system? If they are, I've, I've connected two dots together and I've got a line of something that says I need to immediately go and rectify this. Or similarly, with uh, our risk matrix that we have, which I talked about how we classify our assets, uh, sorry, our vulnerabilities around those three things, time, impact, and skill. Here is a matrix. So the top right-hand corner of this matrix is how IP360 can easily give you, the, you know, what you need to fix now. So it's looking at the automated remote privilege aspect. So I've just selected a few um, uh, uh, segments in there and then said, right, if I see any asset that comes in here, I need to tag that asset as, oh my God, this is vulnerable. Quick, 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 quick. Do a whole bunch of stuff on there. And then when I fix those vulnerabilities, this tag will then be removed from that asset because assets are dynamic. They change all the time. That's the point. So if you can go in and actually make changes to these things to make them less risky, you can then remove automatically those seriously, you know, you know those more focused controls if you want to and then automate the entire thing. And that's really where we're going with all of this. It's trying to still use the solutions for what they are best at but then bring them together so you can drive other things. So the final sort of piece of this is um, what do we do with this information once we've got it? And that's a matter of starting to bring data together. Now, you know, Tripwire can offer you know, consolidated reporting across a variety of, of our own solutions. There are other um, organizations out there that do you know, very high level, you know, bring everything from everything together. The more context you can put around any information you put anywhere within a reporting ecosystem, is absolutely vital. So if I can see that a critical change took place on a system that was of high risk, I can make a decision about where I put that data. Whether it goes into an alerting mechanism or a reporting mechanism or both, that's absolutely critical. The key thing is that we've got a level of context before it goes in there. That allows us to then slice data very effectively. So in this particular instance, what we've got here is you know, essentially a reporting database. It takes change, it takes configuration data, and it shows you all this information in the same place um, on, a, on a dashboard. Or we can go in and we can start drilling into various different bits of data as well. Clicky click. Um, so here you can see you know, we've got you know, various different layers. So we're looking in Portland, and then we're drilling in and seeing you know, this is the high risks uh, checks. You know, Something's happened, it's gone down, what's happened? We can see actually the compliance levels have got worse. Where specifically? It's specifically in the databases. What specific database? SQL Server. So being able to go in and you know, classify all these assets appropriately allows me to see all these different things. Similarly, we might want to look at how we are viewing you know, data based on everything else. So you know, I've got my IP3... 60 vulnerability rating of critical based on my line of business of financial reporting. And then I'm looking at my overall level of compliance. So I'm taking data from how critically vulnerable that asset is and then some non-IT function bit of information that says its business is financial reporting. And then I'm looking at you know, where I should be. So we've defined that our business, our financial reporting should be, have a benchmark of 80% compliance and we're not even close to it. So I can focus my efforts here because this may be my high risk. And that's really, you know, the sort of summary of all of this is you need to be able to focus effort 
To be secure, there's a whole slew of information that you're going to get from all sorts of systems. This is just an example of the ones that Tripwire manage. But we can start bringing that together. So you can start viewing information from all of the products that Tripwire have, bring them together, add them onto, add the context between all of them so that you can get more actionable information out of them. And a lot of that is purely about context. And you know, Tripwire offer you know, open APIs for third party um, tagging and things like that as well that allow you to do further information on here. So if I scoot through to um, the last slide here, the key message really from us is the fully integrated suites are not really cutting it at the moment because they typically look for bits of technology that don't really go together and try and converge it together. This is your fridge with the TV in it or the, you know, the car with wings kind of stuff. So you often end up with information that's you know, combined together that doesn't mean anything or doesn't help you. Whereas actually what we should be looking at is what are these security controls doing? What attributes are they actually looking at? And how do we you know, bring all of that stuff together? So we need to look for things that share context. And that context could be a variety of different things. It could, as I say, we've looked at things like line of business, you know, um, risk ratings, all classification, could be level of monitoring, could be anything. Look for that and look for it within a business context as well. Um, so security controls that can be independent but cooperative. One of the other things that's problematic about having the same tool do everything is there's no verification component in there. And it's not that you want to have two things doing everything, but if one thing is essentially bringing all this stuff together, no, that's, you know, that's absolutely fine, then you need to look at it and say, well, actually, something else could look at it in a completely different way. So if I'm going to look at, say, vulnerability management, as a prime example, um, I've got vulnerabilities in there, but I might want to look at line of sight to that asset. You know, is that going to exist in the same solution? No, probably not. There's people who do these sorts of things. So you may want to look at, you know, how do we get line of sight information into our vulnerability information? And there's integrations and stuff that we can do that help all of that stuff. Or asset discovery. You know, how do we get asset discovery into our solutions so that we are actually monitoring everything? Um, and then solutions that leverage common frameworks are obviously vital. And those common frameworks can be defined however you like. So asset tagging and identification, risk assessment, business information. You know, that's something that is, you know, the stuff that you get to put on a whiteboard and everyone shouts about in a room, that sort of stuff is where you can really go and do some very interesting things. If you get that sort of stuff right, it allows you to be far more driven into the right places to secure things. So, I'm kind of done. Um, I have some pretty pictures on the side of this slide, but essentially what we're looking at is bringing all these things together to get a common messaging around security. We've got to do it piece, piece by piece. There's too many vendors out there. The key thing is to use the best vendor that suits your environment and then look for the context between them all that you can share and then allow that to drive how those solutions work. Essentially dynamically change how your monitoring is going to work so that you get the most effective use of it. All right. So I think that's it from me. I, I've talked for probably about five minutes too long. Um, I hope you're all still awake. Um, are there any questions that anyone has? I can't see any that have come through. If you have any questions, uh, there's a Q&A button. Um, please feel free to uh, send any through to me. I'll, I'll leave the line open for five minutes while we get those um, and take it from there. So the um, 
question is, uh, I had a question come in which is about uh, whether or not we'll make the slides available. Um, I'll just need to quickly check to make sure that there's nothing you know, proprietary in there, particularly some of the screenshots I've got are for an, an upcoming release, so I, don't, I won't be able to let those out, but I'll try and get those through. Um, I believe this session is also recorded, so you can certainly use those, uh, the recordings as well. Um, Follow-up question to that one is where can we get the slides recording? Um, I believe an email will probably be sent out with the recording link. I think we have them all on our website as well. So, um, yeah, we'll take it from there. I will get something out to you. All right, so um, there's no more questions come through. So with that, I shall let you get back on with your days. Um, thank you ever so much for your attendance. It's greatly appreciated. I hope you found it useful. Um, my contact details, um, or my contact email address is on the final slide there. If you do want to go through anything on a one-to-one -one basis, please feel free to contact me. Um, I will endeavor to get back to you as soon as I can. I'm happy to get on a call, correspond by email, all that sort of thing. So with that, Thank you very much. Have a great day, and I'll hopefully see you on one of the other sessions that we have later.